Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our webinar on patent basics. We're going to give uh, people a few minutes to log in and, and get settled. My name is Donna McCown. I'm the operations manager for the Maricopa SBDC. And we are being joined by Lou Farina, who is a business analyst with us, as well as Stephen Kozel. I don't, sorry, Stephen, if I mispronounce your last name, um, as well as Julie Mason. They are co-presenters co on this program. So uh, our structure for this morning is going to be, um, if you have any questions that you would like the panelists to answer, if you could please go ahead and put them in the Q&A box that is available to you. Uh, please don't put them in the chat just because they might get lost um, in the chat there. And um, we'll monitor those, those Q's and Q&As and, and give us um, a chance to get those answered. And um, we'll do that you know, within, within the presentation. Um, we won't answer them as soon as they come in. So with that, it is nine o'clock and I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Lou. Okay, thank you, Donna. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to um, a webinar today, Patent Basics. And uh, this is uh, the second in our series uh, from the US um, Patent and Trademark Office um, presentation. Um, we, um, we're, we're very fortunate today to have um, a couple of folks from the Patent and Trademark Office. I'll introduce them to you in a second here. But uh, what we're going to do today is um, talk about patents. And if any of you had joined us for our last one, we talked about intellectual property. Um, and we talked about patents um, specifically, but we're going to drill down on patents today. And we're going to talk about different types of patents, utility, design, and plan patents. We'll talk about the difference between a provisional, non-provisional patent. We'll talk about process, uh, the role of the patent examiner, what to expect when working with the, the USPTO. So our topics for today are going to be uh, the types of patents, parts of the patent apl uh, application process, the examination process, claims analysis, uh, respect to novelty and obviousness, and then office action. So. Um, I am Lou Farina. Some of you I may know, some of you I may not know, but I am the uh, business analyst here responsible for uh, specialty and technology commercialization. Um, I will talk to you a little bit about counseling next. So this is the SBDC. We're going to do just a little bit, of, little bit on the SBDC before we get into Steve's presentation. Um, so SBDC, Small Business Development uh, Center, is part of the America's um, Arizona Network. The, in the Arizona network, there's 10 different SBDC centers. Uh, we've got actually in our center, which is Maricopa County, we've got 17 different counselors um, with different specialties. We do counseling, at no fee, we do training, and this is part of our training regimen, uh, no fee, and then we have other resources. And we'll talk to you about all three of those real quickly. Um, in the technical assistance areas, some of the specialty areas, you know, at the top of the list, there's disaster loan assistance. and and Last year at this time, it wasn't even on the list, really. Um, but we've done a lot of that over the last uh, 14 months or so with regard to PPP and idle, um, idle uh, programs and, and now with the restaurant funds and um, some of the others. The, uh, we also do lender readiness preparation. A lot of what we do is work with uh, potential uh, with, with clients who are looking for uh, SBA type loans. Um, they come to us, lenders like it because we help prepare them, help prepare the loan package, and we can actually help steer them to a lender that may have an appetite for their loan. Um, we do a lot of financial review. We do, we've got specialists in marketing, marketing assessments. We have specialists in buying and selling a business, exit strategies. We've got a specialist in manufacturing technology commercialization, which is me. We have a couple specialists in export and international trade. And then we've got a sister organization called uh, PTAC, which um, actually just really focuses on government contracting. So here are some of the resources um, that we, we have available to you. These are, we, I call them tools. Um, so I'm gonna go through them one by one, just very quickly. So we have a tool called Growth Wheel. And that helps owners uh, focus on specific aspects of their business. And for me, this is kind of good for um, existing businesses. We can kind of help, you know, do an assessment, kind of figure out where you think you need help and help prioritize, then use the resources within this tool to help, um, to help 
in the areas that need help. Um, we've got Live Plan, and, uh, and and these are again these are no fee platforms. They're actually fee based if you're on if you are commercial or just a a, a, um, a consumer. But for through us, we actually can offer these to you guys for nothing. Um, Live Plan is um, an online platform which helps develop business plans. And it, it's uh, it's really good for you know folks you know if you if you're in if you're looking for money, you got to do a, a business plan. Uh, that's kind of like table stakes. And this is a way for you know I could send you a template or I can send you this tool. The this tool helps you uh, online kind of create your business plan. It's a very easy, intuitive way to to get to move forward. Um, Profit Sense. Profit Sense is a uh, it's a web based financial analysis tool. Um, and you'll see SageWorks, there's SageWorks industry data. That's a common data set. It's not owned by, um, by ProfitSense per se, but this data set's really powerful because if you have an existing business and you provide me um, with your financials, I can actually plug them in and, and compare them to similar businesses. And so you'll know from, you know from a metrics perspective where you are with regard to um, some of the ratios and some of the financial parameters. Um, we, we have some uh, um, ability for, uh, to do market research. So IBIS World is a market research services report. They provide what I call canned reports on, on many topics, not all topics. Um, we, get these, we get these for nothing. These are free to our clients. However, you know, if you were to buy these um, uh, on the street, they're about $1,500 a report. Now, for anybody who's doing any kind of uh, early stage equity um, raising or writing a business plan or an S SBIR where you have to have some validated market research, this is an excellent source to be able to um, be able to provide that. It's uh, the topics are broad, but they um, they drill down pretty well, and uh, they I think these these hold up really really well. And then we've got another custom um, service through our SBDC net organization. We can do some custom uh, market research. So we're going to start um, our presentation here. And the first thing we're going to, we're going to do is we're going to launch a poll. And uh, we're going to ask you to tell us about your business. But have you filed a patent? And there you go. Don has put up a poll. If you'll please, we'll take a couple um, seconds here. If you will fill it in, it just helps me and helps Steve uh, really to understand who's in the audience and maybe kind of tailor, um, tailor a presentation a little bit to you. So Donna, when it's when it's done, Donna will um, will flash the results on the screen for all of us. Yeah, I'm going to wait about uh, about a third of you or two thirds of you have, have voted. I had to do math in my head, um, so I'm going to wait about maybe 15 uh, more seconds. And while we're doing that, Lou, I did have a question pop up already that said, um, uh, "Who should you have review your claims if you filed a pro C and are on a budget?" And how do you decide how many drawings you'll need? Can you go through the fee structure for submitting back and forth? So maybe you might answer those questions um, as we go through, but I just wanted to. Okay, well, I won't answer those. I will certainly punt those questions to Steve when he, uh, <laughs> when he, when he, uh, when he gets into his presentation. Okay, um, so here we go. I'm gonna go ahead and end and the poll. Okay, good, interesting. So, um, you know, about half of us are just here for education, starting to learn about patents. And, you know, an another third or so is, is looking, um, trying to figure out if their idea is patentable. And then we've got a couple that have, you know, been issued patents and filed. So, excellent. So now I'm gonna introduce Steve Koziel. Um, he's the Assistant Regional Director from the uh, Western Regional U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. And um, he's going to do the, uh, the bulk of the presentation today. Um, I won't read this to you. He's, got, uh, um, he's been with the uh, USPTO for a while. And I will let Stephen, um, as he takes, you know, shares his screen, uh, provide his, his background as he kicks off his, uh, his content. So Stephen, this would be a good time for you to, to share. I think I have to stop sharing. There we go. Okay, thank you, Lou, and hopefully you can you can see my screen now. Um, and uh, yeah, 
Great, wonderful. So good morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, for agreeing to, to spend part of your day learning about uh, intellectual property and patents in, in particular. Uh, like like Lou said, uh, I'm, I'm Steve Koziel. I work for the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Uh, you know, we are the, uh, the the sole federal agency that's vested with the responsibility of accepting um, ap patent applications in the United States, uh, examining them, and uh, and issuing uh, issuing valid patents. Uh, so I started my career uh, with the agency as a as a patent examiner. I worked uh, worked as as an examiner for a number of years. Uh, had managed a, a few teams of uh, of examiners across uh, across different disciplines. Uh, and have uh, worked in a number of different offices uh, in the agency, uh, both at headquarters back uh, in the DC suburbs, uh, to our, our Denver office, and, uh, and, and now our, our West Coast office, uh, which, which happens to be located in San Jose. Uh, but we do serve, uh, broadly speaking, the, the Western United States, um, basically everything that touches the Pacific Ocean, plus Arizona and uh, and Nevada, uh, really with an effort uh, and a focus on bringing uh, some of the educational resources of the USPTO to people exactly like you, uh, who uh, maybe have an interest in uh, in patents or just want to learn more about how they might fit into your business strategy. Uh, we'll we'll talk a little bit about um, just the reality of some of the costs of uh, of getting into the system and what resources might uh, might be out there for you uh, to to help deal with those costs. Uh, and we'll we'll do like uh, like Lou said, a, a bit of a deep dive. Uh, into the the patent document itself, I saw there were some some good questions right off the bat about you know the parts, form, and and content of the patent application. So we'll definitely talk uh, about all all of that and and look really at the anatomy of the the patent itself. Um, and and then I'll I'll end uh, with some uh, some resources both from the USPTO and uh, from organizations that we've partnered with um, that kind of can get you started on the next steps of either you know preparing your application or 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 seeing about you know filing or working with an attorney to file your application. So um, so with that I, I've got maybe about an hour or so of, uh, of, of content that I'd, I'd like to share. And uh, like I said, these slides will be available to you after this, uh, this session this morning. So don't feel that you need to, to take screen captures or to, to write down or scribble down anything that uh, you see flash across your screen. Uh, you'll have access to all of this, uh, all of this after the presentation today. Um, and, uh, and, and I, do want to make room for for Q and A at the end, um, so I've got at least hopefully uh, you know twenty to thirty minutes at the end reserved for Q and A. So, uh, so like I believe Donna said, if you can use, uh, I believe you're using the Q and A box uh, as opposed to the chat box this morning. Uh, so as you as you have questions, uh, you know, please feel free to add them to the Q and A box. Uh, hopefully, I'll, I'll at least partially address most of them as we go through the content. But uh, we've got some time at the end for uh, for addressing your your questions as well. Um, so, so with that, I'll I'll just go ahead and and kick things off uh, here. And just as a as, as a bit of a history lesson, uh, we'd like to to talk about the foundation of. Uh, of, of intellectual property rights and, and patent rights in particular, and it's it's one of the few uh, in, in a few areas where we can point directly to the the Constitution as the foundation for the the nation's intellectual property system, right? Article one, section eight, clause eight, uh, in, in the Constitution really establishes that that authority for the United States to. Uh, to issue patents uh, for for a limited time to uh, to inventors, and you know it's it it may be apocryphal, but just to give you a a flavor, you know we're a 220 something year old federal agency, and the first patent examiner was was Thomas Jefferson, and you know the the story at least that we we tell among ourselves is that he uh, you know he would 
receive uh, new applications for, for patent throughout the week and kind of store them under his bed in, in a shoebox. And on weekends, Thomas Jefferson would, would you know, would remove the shoebox from his bed and, and start reviewing those those patent applications. And that was kind of the the genesis of, uh, of patent examination in uh, at least here in the United States. And you know we there's a there's that direct lineage of uh, of, of our office and, and what we do you know all the way back to the the founding of the country. So IP rights and, and patent rights in, in particular really you know do trace their origin back to the the, the founding uh, of, uh, of of our nation. So, um, so what is a patent? Um, and I, I think one thing that we like to make people aware of right off the bat is that a patent is a right to exclude others from doing a bunch of things, from making your invention, from selling your invention, or from importing in the United States your invention, right? It's a, it's a right to exclude. And I, I emphasize that because I think a lot of times people, you know, maybe you've watched, uh, maybe you've watched Shark Tank, and you've heard them ask, you know, hey, do you have a patent on this? And you think, oh, if I've got a patent, then that's it. I'm on easy street. I've, uh, I'm, 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 I'm done. And and that's that's not really the case, right? The, the, a patent is not a monopoly on your idea. It's it's not um, it, you know, there. There's no federal agency that's going to enforce your conveys you as the to exclude others from essentially copying your idea and it's the onus on you I'm, i've i've been told that i'm disconnected we can hear you now stephen but there was a little bit that was uh broken up okay i i apologize for that and um are you able to see my my what is a patent slide? No, we're still on the outline. All right, let's let's try that again. I'm not sure what the challenge is here. As we like to say, technology. <laughs> There we go. Now we can see what is a patent. All right. Well, and 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 Donna, if you if you don't mind, just jump in if uh, if I do get uh, do get jumbled up here uh, again. I, I apologize for for that. Um, but we'll we'll forge ahead and and uh, and and find a way to make it work. So. Um, so anyway, I was just trying to emphasize that uh, that uh, you know, the, the, the patent right itself uh, puts the onus on you as the inventor and as the owner of the patent to monitor the marketplace for potential knockoffs of your idea, potential infringers of your idea. Um, and you know, no, no one is going to police your idea for you. It's uh, so that's that's really what where that right to exclude uh, comes from. It's it's on you, as the owner and as the inventor, to uh, to, to to police that right, and uh, and to make sure that your um, uh, that, that that your invention is not being knocked off. Uh, and and the last thing I'll say here is that all IP rights, all intellectual property rights, uh, particularly the patent rights, uh, are, are are territorial. Meaning that a U.S. patent protects you, gives you that right to exclude others, um, only in the U.S. Right. So as you as you think about you know what your you know what your market looks like, you know, are you looking at you know 
Europe, Southeast Asia, Japan, Australia, you know, where are you going to be deriving significant revenue for your, your product, your invention? Um, you need to be thinking about the corresponding intellectual property rights in those jurisdictions because that's the only way you're going to be protected in those jurisdictions, right? A U.S. patent is not going to protect you in China. A U.S. patent does not give you coverage or that right to exclude across Europe, right? It's only the local, you know, territorial um, IP right and patent grant um, that is going to protect you in, in those markets. Uh, and so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that and how to think through that strategy uh, later on. Um, Okay, so I've advanced my slide to uh, to types of, of patents, and, and hopefully you, you can you can see that and, and yep, follow along. Good. Yes. Um, okay, great. Thank you, Donna. Um, so I'll just briefly mention, uh, and, and I kind of alluded to this before uh, when we talked about Shark Tank. Um, but a lot of times the question is, do you have a patent? Do you have a patent? Uh, and when we say that, what we mean more often than not is do you have what's known as a utility patent? Uh, and utility patents are just one of three flavors uh, of, of patents that you can get. Uh, and you know, over you know, 95% of patents issued fall under this, this category of utility patents. And they're broadly speaking what you would think of as the traditional patent for invention. Uh, however, there are two other flavors of, of patents that are out there, and we'll just briefly mention them. Uh, design patents. Uh, so a utility patent, as I said, is the typical patent for invention. It covers what the product does, um, broadly speaking. Uh, but a design patent covers the ornamental look of a functional product, All right? So think about that. The utility patent covers the, the function, what the product does, and the design patent can cover what the product looks like, right? The ornamental appearance, the ornamental shape of a functional product. Uh, and that can be very important. Right. If you're relying, for example, on visual distinctiveness of your product, if you're going to be selling your product in, in, a, in a hardware store and it's competing against a row of other consumer goods that look you know, very similar, you know, sometimes the consumer is going to make a decision within just a few seconds of glancing on the product at the product. And you know, the, the visual distinctiveness How many consumers, if, okay, and apparently I was, I've, I've just been muted. Um, so hopefully I'm, I'm back now. Um, but if you're, you know, if, if you're relying on, on the visual distinctiveness of your product, uh, you know, a design patent can help protect those visually distinctive features. Uh, and that can be very important. Uh, for example, uh, if you recall over the past decade, the ongoing litigation between Apple and, and Samsung uh, over their, their, their phones, their mobile phones, um, at the heart of part of that litigation was, was actually a design patent, right? There was an accusation that uh, there was copying of the, the look, of the appearance of the phones themselves. And, you know, that design of the phones was you know, something that eventually led to a multi-billion dollar, uh, you know, settlement or, or, or outcome in that case. So don't overlook the importance of the visual aesthetic, the visual design and appearance of your product. Um, and yes, you can protect that. And, and again, especially if you're competing um, on visual distinctiveness, uh, design patents are there to protect those visually distinctive features of your of your product. 
Uh, and, and last but not least, uh, plant patents. Uh, and I, I won't really spend a lot of time on that, but um, if, uh, if you're in that, uh, in, in that field of, of growing, um, you know, for example, ornamental roses, um, or uh, you know, new, uh, you, you know, particularly drought-resistant crops. Uh, there's there's the opportunity for for plant patent protection as well. So, Stephen, we do have a couple questions from Evelyn. I don't know if you wanted to go ahead and answer them now, if you wanted to wait until um, you got through your presentation. Sure. Great. I'll, I'll I'll jump in there. It looks like there's a there's a design uh, design patent question. Um, yeah, it's uh, it, it's it's interesting there. Um, yes. So the the example uh, for the design patent um, of, uh, for example, uh, the design of a shoe. Um, you know, that's a that's a great example of uh, both here and and internationally. Um, where uh, you know it's it's the visual distinctiveness that that really matters, right? There there may be a, a utility patent um, in in the way that the shoe is manufactured, but you know what the consumer isn't buying the shoe because of you know the method of manufacture. They're they're buying it because of the visual distinctiveness, right? So. Um, that would be a, a perfect example here in the U.S. or, or internationally, where you can um, where you can protect that uh, through through design patents. Um, so I'm going to move ahead here and just talk a little bit about some of the business considerations of uh, of, of of patenting. Um, you know, some of the things that a patent can contribute to uh, to your business. Um, include, um, you know, just making your, your business more attractive to a, a potential acquirer. Uh, if you think of a patent as an asset that can add value to your company uh, because you now own that right to prevent others from copying your product and selling your product, um, you know, that's the, the patent is uh, is the thing that, you know, really prevents those copycats. And that adds that's an asset, right? That adds value to uh, to your company. Uh, and depending on what your if you have an exit strategy and you're looking to get acquired or you're looking to IPO or you're looking to merge, um, you know, your your patents are, are an asset that adds adds value and makes you a more attractive uh, candidate if you're if you're looking to be acquired merge IPO um, and and so really think of it as an asset class um, as as a piece of property you know similar to your uh, you know similar to the equipment that you may own uh, similar to the retail space that you may own or the the, the physical buildings that you own uh, the the patent is another asset that signifies the ownership of the uh, of your inventive uh, product of of your, you know, those those visual distinctive features of your product, um, and it's 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 really one more, uh, you know, one more line on the balance sheet that can add uh, that can add value to uh, to the company. Uh, and and to try to put a number on that. Um, you know, we, we did a study a few years back looking at uh, IP, what we call IP intensive industries. Uh, and, and we found that there's about 45, just over 45 million jobs in the US that are directly supported uh, by industries that rely significantly on, on patents, on, on trademarks and on intellectual property in general, accounting for you know, almost 40% almost of, the, of the GDP uh, of, in, in the US. And you know, the, those, those industries also correlate to a much higher pay uh, for employees working in those industries. So again, IP is an asset that can add value uh, to your to your company, and you see that reflected here uh, across uh, across the U.S. economy broadly. Okay, so I'm going to 
pivot a little bit here to to start to really dive into the the patent itself. What is it? What goes into it? Uh, and and what can you do to start preparing for uh, for your patent application if you think you need one? Um, so again, I won't I won't dwell on uh, on each of these slides. These are you can take these for for reference after the fact. But this is the face of a patent document here. Um, Whatever search tool you use to uh, to, to, to find uh, you know to find patents, uh, you're, you're going to see this pop up as as the face of of every of every patent document. You're going to see it it looks the same roughly um, over time, right? And you're going to see a, a number of, uh, of of features here. Um, the, uh, the the title, the inventors, and the assignee. Um, and we'll we'll talk about the difference between an inventor and an assignee uh, in, in in a bit, um, as as well as um, you know the dates the dates that the application was both filed and issued. Uh, I'll, I'll note here that uh, this one was filed in 2004, but it didn't issue as a patent until 2011. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that later. What's the process from filing to issuance that a patent goes through? Um, you'll see drawings. There was a question early on about drawings. How many are required? Um, uh, you know, what, what goes into a drawing? Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a bit more detail. Uh, and and this, this abstract here, uh, and as you're reviewing patent documents or doing a search to see if somebody else has done, you know, come up with their invention, this abstract, which is always going to be on the cover of the patent, is incredibly valuable. It's, a, it's the quickest one paragraph summary of the inventive concept uh, that you'll get out of the patent document. So you can spend hours, you know, reading a single patent document uh, in, in, in detail to find out what it covers. But if you're just looking to get a sense of, of what's out there in, in your field of in your industry, uh, the, the abstract that's on the front cover of the patent is the quickest, uh, you know, kind of something you can digest in 30 seconds that tells you what the invention really is about and should allow you to, to make the decision, okay, I, I need to be aware of this or, or now nah, this doesn't affect me, I can, I can move on. Um, what I didn't show on the previous slide is probably the most important part of a patent and that's the patent claim. Uh, and if you haven't heard, uh, if you haven't spent a lot of time reading patent documents, uh, you know, they're, they're a hybrid. They're, they're both a technical document that describes how to make your invention, make you know, what you've come up with, um, but they're also a legal document as well. They're a legal document that sets forth the boundaries of your invention, of your idea um, relative to what's been done before. Right, so the, the analogy here that can be useful is to, you know, if you analogize intellectual property to real property, uh, particularly, uh, you know, say your, if you think of your your backyard, uh, and you've got, you know, maybe you've got a fence that delineates your, you know, your property from your neighbor's property. Um, the claims in a patent are your fence. The claims in, in, a, in a patent uh, delineates what your invention, legally speaking, what your invention is relative to what's been what's been done before, uh, and that's why uh, that's why I think that the claims are you know the most significant part of of a patent document. Um, so. Here's just one example of, uh, of a very basic, what a very basic claim might look like for this, this invention of a chair. Uh, and, and you can see that a claim always starts uh, with what we call this, uh, the, this preamble, this introduction. Uh, it's just a chair and there's this transitional word here comprising. 
Uh, that just lets you know that uh, the, the chair is going to comprise multiple parts. And you see each of these parts here uh, delineated. Uh, one thing to note is that in every patent document that you see, the claims are going to be at the very end of the document. So if you're if you're flipping through the patent document, you want to know where, okay, where's the fence? Where where's this person's fence? Flip to the end and you'll you'll see the claims. And you'll also typically see that every single claim is written in this odd structure, but it's basically a single sentence. Uh, so for those of you that were, were English majors, you may, you may cringe at the sentence structure here, but uh, by law, every single patent claim is required to be written in this format as a, as a single uh, sentence that delineates each of the parts of the invention that you are claiming as you know, your, your fence. Um, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit uh, further on in, in the presentation about but, you know, is it a good idea, especially if you're new, if you're new to patenting, if this is your first application, you know, is it a good idea for you, uh, someone who's new to the system, to write your own claim? Or is that something where you should work with maybe a registered patent attorney to help you uh, with, with, your, with your claims? And maybe more broadly, what can you do uh, individually uh, and where does it make sense to start working with a registered and licensed patent attorney or agent uh, to, to help you along the way? Uh, and, and the claims are, uh, are, are a huge part of that, uh, where where the value of an attorney really comes into play. Um, so we'll, we'll we'll get into uh, we'll get into a little bit more of that um, in in a few minutes. Okay, so I, I alluded to earlier the uh, the idea of both the inventor and the the assignee. Uh, so I'll talk about that in a little more detail here. Uh, so the inventor, at least legally speaking, on a patent document, an inventor is anyone anyone on your team that's contributed to the conception of the invention itself. So even if you were the lead inventor and you did 90% of the work coming up with this invention, uh, if you worked with you know, family or team members or, 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 or people in your company and asked them for their input and they provided input that you then incorporated into your invention, it's likely that that person is legally speaking an inventor and should be listed. If you flip back to the beginning of the uh, of the front page of that patent document, should be listed as an inventor on the patent. All right. So keep that in mind. Right. Keep in mind that anyone you talk to, get good input from and incorporate that into the invention. Um, they are they are an inventor and and should be listed. Uh, conversely, uh, the, the assignee, uh, the person who you assign ownership rights to, uh, if, you know, it can be, if, if, if you're the sole inventor, you can, you can, you know, assign ownership rights to your, your company. Um, if you don't want to own the patent yourself in your personal capacity, uh, if you're working for an employer, uh, you're probably under some type of, uh, of assignment where any ideas that you come up with on the job, uh, yes, you can be listed as the inventor, but you're obligated to assign your rights to your, your employer. Um, so just keep in mind that there is a legal distinction between the inventor and who the invention is assigned to, which is, which is essentially the owner. Um, so we'll, we'll walk through uh, we'll walk through uh, the, the journey from kind of idea to to patent, uh, and I, I alluded to this uh, at the at the very beginning when we talked about utility patents. But to take it one level deeper, uh, what does that utility patent? What what is eligible? Let's say for a utility patent here in the U.S. Uh, and it's fairly broad. Right. And you can see here, broadly speaking, there's four categories, any process. Uh, so anything from a method of manufacturing uh, goods or, 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 or a method of delivering services to a customer. 
uh, any any machine, any you know physical uh, you, know, you know physical product that you're selling, uh, any manufacturer, so printed circuit boards, uh, you know an assemblage of multiple uh, components, uh, and, and compositions of matter. Uh, so these are your 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 typical patents for uh, you know everything from uh, from from you know novel polymers to uh, to drugs to um, uh, other uh, other you know compositions uh, chemical compositions uh, and biopharmaceutical compositions. Okay, so that covers what's eligible for patenting in the U.S. under that utility patent application. Um, so is is that enough? If you've got something, you say, okay, I've got my, you know, I've got my new uh, you know, weed trimming device here, grass trimming device here, my new brand new string trimmer. I've got a novel, you know, uh, it's a it's a novel assembly. I've got this great new, you know, water resistant guard that I've I've placed on the, uh, you know, to protect the motor here. Uh, okay, I, I've clearly identified that it, it fits into one of the categories of invention. Um, what next, right? And the what next is, is your idea novel and non-obvious? And essentially what that means is, has it been done before? That's novel. Has it been done before? And two, would it have been obvious obvious to someone to to do in in exactly the way that you've described it right now the first part of that is is a little bit more straightforward than the second right the first part has it been done before uh it means and and this what we're talking about here really is getting into the job of what a patent examiner does when they pick up your patent application. Um, the patent examiner is going to go out into uh, what we call the uh, any printed publication, uh, any you know whether it's previously issued patent applications, previously uh, you know granted patents, um, or any other printed and publicly accessible application, um, anything from uh, you know a, a, a uh, you know a, a sales brochure, advertising, um, similar trimmers that was again publicly accessible uh, and was disclosed prior to your application. Uh, the examiner uh, does does what's known as a search and comes up with. Uh, with what we call prior art. Um, so again, anything that's been publicly issued uh, that was published prior to the filing of your invention. Um, if, if your exact invention matches what's in the public domain at that point, essentially, or what's available to the public, um, then the examiner would say your idea is not novel, right? Essentially, it's been done before. Uh, in many cases, however, uh, the, the novelty threshold is is one that can be can be passed, uh, and you get into this murkier area of non-obviousness, right? Okay, your invention hasn't been done before, but would it have been obvious to do before? And that's a question of of law. Um, and it's one that there is a degree of subjectivity and that's the bulk of the back and forth that you have or your attorney has with the patent examiner is typically around this idea of, of non-obviousness. Um, so for example, if, um, if your examiner is able to demonstrate that, you know, well, Okay, no one previous product had all of the features of your particular weed trimmer or grass trimmer here. However, the examiner might say, each of the features that you've disclosed in your trimmer has been shown before. It's been shown in, in different trimmers. It's been, it's been shown in previously available commercial products, and it's been disclosed in previous patents, just never in the same way that you've combined them. Um, that may be sufficient to show that, you know what, your idea would have been obvious. If all the parts were out there, 
uh, then then perhaps uh, you don't meet that obviousness threshold uh, that's that's required. Um, so so keep that in mind, right? If uh, if if your invention is a combination of previously known uh, you know I ideas, previously known uh, components. Um, you may run into challenges um, in proving that it would not have been obvious to uh, to you know to combine those components in the way that that you have. Uh, so I, I mentioned prior art on the on the previous slide briefly. This is just more of a formal definition here, uh, but essentially anything that's in the in the public domain, from from patents to other printed disclosures. Uh, again, that were available to the public prior to the filing of your patent application. Uh, so, so what does that mean practically for you? If you've got a great idea, um, you, you know, you, you really you, you want to start selling this product. You think it hasn't been done before, um, and and you want to get it. You, you want to get that patent on it. Uh, I, I think the number one thing you can do at that point is to do this prior art search you know go out there scour the literature scour the patent documents scour the the publications whether it's magazines whether it's it's trade journals whether it's scholarly articles you know scour the literature that's publicly available in your field of endeavor and really look to see if your invention has been has been done before and how much of your invention has been done before right kind of thinking about that obviousness uh, threshold that you've got to clear so you know that can save you a lot of time and a lot of money uh, down the road if you are able to identify what's been done before uh, in, and, you know, this is, you know, I hate to say it, but this can be a blind spot for inventors, right? You've, you've got a great idea. You, you've fallen in love with it. You've spent years developing it. You know, you, you stay up all night, you put in the sweat equity and, and nobody wants to think that, you know, gosh, maybe somebody else did this already or somebody else solved a really similar problem. Uh, but you really need to do that. You, you need to go out there, you need to search, and, and you need to see what's been done before you really go down the road of putting together a patent application or, or, or paying an attorney the big bucks to, to file your patent application for you. So this is a, a great, um, you know, sometimes it's a, it's a bucket of cold water to the face, but it's better to know at the beginning what's been done and what's been published than to wait and spend, you know, tens of thousands of dollars on an attorney only to come back five years later and say, oh, you know, this has been done before, right? So you, you really want to know the lay of the land. You want to know what's out there prior to, to going down your, your journey of filing a patent application. Okay, so let's say you've done that. Let's say you've, 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 you're confident that your invention uh, has a good shot of, of passing those, those novelty and obviousness thresholds that we talked about. Um, so, so what can you do next? You, you, you think, hey, I've got something here. It's eligible for patent protection. I think it would really behoove me to, you know, to ex, you know, to secure that exclusive right for myself and my business. Um, so, what next? Uh, here is is where you can really get into trouble without realizing it. Um, and what gets people to trouble, and this may be the number one mistake that we see, particularly from small businesses, particularly from new companies that are not familiar with the patent system, and this may be their first patent application or the first application they're thinking about filing, is who they talk to about their invention before they file the patent for their invention. Now, this may not seem like a big deal, right? You've got a great idea. You want to share it with the world, right? You, you want to tell people about what you're doing and see what the market is, you know, see who might 
you know, be interested in working with you on manufacturing or, you know, see where you might sell this product. Um, but before you file the patent application, you need to be judicious about who you share and who you disclose your invention to, right? And here in the US, um, a public disclosure of your invention prior to filing your patent application can negatively impact your ability to ever receive patent protection on that invention. Um, and especially in uh, jurisdictions outside the US, it can make it extraordinarily difficult, if not impossible, to secure patent protection if you make a public disclosure of your invention before filing the patent application, right? So by public disclosure, uh, I mean you disclosing the details of your invention in a forum that is accessible by an average member of the public. So you writing a blog post and publishing it on your personal website, you recording a, a video uh, you know, that, that shows your invention and disclosing it, you know, posting it on, uh, on, on, on YouTube or a similar page to, uh, to make publicly available. You starting a crowdfunding campaign um, that offers to sell your product um, prior to filing a patent application. Right. All of those are examples of public disclosure of your invention, and they can, uh, again, negatively affect your ability uh, and sometimes completely eliminate your ability to secure patent protection, both in the U.S. and abroad. So, uh, again, you know, keep your invention to yourself or to your attorney. Uh, until such time as you're ready to file the patent application, right? Once you have that patent pending status, then you have a lot more flexibility in what you can disclose, who you can talk to, and how much you can share about your idea. But prior to filing, again, be extraordinarily judicious about who you disclose uh, and, and what you disclose, who you disclose to and what you disclose. Okay, so I'm going to move through some of these fairly quickly, um, but we're going to look here at what actually goes into the patent document itself, right? So you've, you've got your idea, you think it's novel and non-obvious, uh, you've been diligent about who you've spoken with, uh, and you're ready to file. You're, you're actually ready to, to take your, your product, take your idea, and turn it into an application that you can submit to our office and 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 get your patent pending status um, so what goes into a patent application that's what we're going to look at for these these next few slides and think about a, a patent application um, as essentially a how-to manual you know you're describing how to make and use your invention in other words you're, you're giving away your inventive concept. You're telling the world through your patent application your secret sauce, you know, the invention that you came up with, right? And, and in exchange for that, in exchange for you, again, telling the world your, your invention, telling the world how to make and use your, you know, your invention, um, you get in exchange that exclusive right. Right, that right to exclude others from from copying and and profiting from your invention right that's what we call the quid pro quo that's really at the heart of the patent system you tell us how you did it in sufficient detail that anyone of your skill could pick it up pick up your patent application read it and and make it and in exchange you have the right to, again, prevent others from, from copying, from knocking off your product and, and selling it uh, or importing it for sale here in the US, right? So that's the, that's the heart of the patent you know, bargain here in the US. You tell us what you did and you get the, in exchange, 
you get the right to keep others from uh, from doing that. Uh, so I'm going to I'm going to jump ahead because there was a question uh, that we saw earlier on about filing fees. Um, so so again, you, you you put together your application, and it's typically going to be um, you, you know a, a written description that walks someone through. Uh, what it is that you've invented and describes how you, you know, what challenge that you faced, you know, what motivated you to, uh, to come up with this invention. Uh, and as you think about that, a, a good patent application often tells a story, you know, and it starts with a problem. You know, I was, you know, every weed whacker that I've ever used, you know, would get jammed in a certain way. And I, I just couldn't, you know, no matter what I did, I, I, I kept encountering the same problem, right? So there, there's usually a problem at the, at the start of, uh, of a patent application. Um, then you might step back and describe the state of the art as it existed at the time that you filed, you know. Uh, most uh, most weed whackers, most uh, you know grass trimmers, you know, all had you know similar guards and and had similar you know string pullers and 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 similar attachments, and none of them were up to the task of you know solving the problem that you solved, right? So you start with the problem, you point out the deficiencies of what's been done, and then you launch into what you did to solve the problem. And you get specific and you get in enough detail you describing what you did to solve the problem that you introduced um, again in sufficient detail so that someone of your skill could pick up your application read it front cover to cover and say oh i could i could manufacture that i could build that i i, I know how this works Right? That's the level of detail that you would need to get into in the patent document itself. And a lot of that is in writing, but it's also supplemented by drawings. And so ev almost every patent application you see uh, is going to include those, those drawings as well. And there was a question in the chat box earlier about how many drawings or how do you know? Um, and, it, you know, there's no one answer to that um, but the the best answer i can give is you need enough drawings to meet that threshold of again somebody of your skill in in your field of endeavor has to be able to pick up your patent application read it cover to cover and be able to say i know how to make and use what you've disclosed, you know, your invention in that application. That can be done in one drawing for some inventions. That can take 50 drawings in some inventions. It's up to the level of technical complexity of your invention that determines how many drawings, how much detail you need to disclose in the, the written portion. Uh, you know, essentially, how big is your how-to manual for making and using the invention? Uh, so again, typically more more complex, more technically involved applications have uh, have more uh, require more detail, more drawings, more written description, uh, and it's it's really a sliding scale um, in, in terms of what that, how that translates into the length of any given patent application. Uh, so stop here and just look briefly at the what it costs. So you, you've put together your how-to manual, you've got your drawings, you've got your written description. Um, I'll just look at the fees here. Uh, and and the, the one thing that, that hopefully stands out um, is discounts are available uh, depending on the size of your company. Uh, so if you're what we call a micro entity, uh, essentially you're a, a small business that hasn't filed a lot of patent applications in the past uh, and, and your income is under a, a certain threshold, um, 
you may qualify for micro entity status, which is a, a substantial discount on all patent filing fees uh, across the board. Um, I'm not going to get into the details of, uh, of, of how to qualify uh, for each of these different uh, fee reductions, uh, but there is a link at the end of the presentation that uh, that talks about how you might qualify. But the, the takeaway here is, uh, you know, don't pay more than you have to uh, when it comes to filing an application with the USPTO. Uh, because there may be, and especially if you're new, there are likely uh, discounts available uh, to you. So, uh, again, we'll we'll talk a little bit a uh, little bit about that at the very end when we when we get into resources. Okay, so you've you've put your application together, you filed it. Uh, it's now it's in the hands of your patent examiner. Okay, and. The job of the patent examiner is to, to, to then take your your written application, you know, scour your, uh, your your drawings, your your written description, uh, look at your claims, um, and and again to see if that invention has been has been done before. If what you're claiming is your invention has been done before, uh, so the examiner spends a lot of their time doing a search for prior art. Uh, the examiner uh, then is going to do an assessment uh, of, uh, of of the state of the uh, the state of the art as it existed at the time that you filed, uh, and more likely than not, the first response you get from your patent examiner is going to contain a rejection of a, of at least part of your of your application. Um, you know that's that's normal. Uh, that that and that's that's something that you can overcome. Uh, you know, I, I think that the number is something above uh, above eighty percent of, uh, of of patent applications initially are rejected, um, and and again that that's the examiner kind of doing their job and saying, hey, you know, th this part of your application needs to be a little bit more clear, or this part of your your claim, you know, your fence, you, you know, you you got a little greedy. In where you drew your fence, you know your fence is really encroaching on part of your neighbor's yard here. I need you to move your fence in a few feet, and and you do that through the language in your your claims, right? Those claims that we looked at earlier. Uh, so there's there's going to be a back and forth between you as the applicant, your attorney if you're working with one, and and the and the patent examiner. Uh, and so on average, right now, from the time that you file. A patent application to the time that it, it, it eventually gets allowed, uh, it, it takes on average about two, little over two years uh, of back and forth uh, with your your patent examiner in order to get your application, uh, you know, to clear up all of those rejections and to get your application uh, application allowed. Uh, and that back and forth is typically done in writing through what's known as an office action. Uh, essentially, it's a it's a summary of the examiner's findings. You know, you'll get to see all of the prior art that the examiner found in their search. You'll get to see how the examiner translated that prior art to your your particular application. You'll see the examiner's decision on the novelty, on obviousness, uh, and on the clarity of your application as well. And so, if there are issues that the examiner has found, and like I said, and overwhelming majority of, of applications, the examiner is going to find some issues, uh, you'll receive an office action that, uh, that, that indicates that. And I think I'm going to kind of jump ahead here to, uh, to kind of show, you know, the, like I said, the first action you're going to see from your examiner, 84% of the time there's going to be something that the examiner has rejected to. However, um, work with your examiner address the concerns you know you can always have the opportunity to uh, to pick up the phone and call the examiner if you're if you'd like more information about why they've rejected your application uh, and and what you see is that over 58 percent of the applications that that are, are filed uh, eventually do issue as as patents. So from that initial 84% rejection rate, 
Um, that 84 uh, percent rejection turns into uh, 58 percent get allowed and and uh, and, and become a, a U.S. patent. Uh, so uh, don't despair uh, when you receive that initial rejection uh, because there's you know there's a lot. Uh, uh, you still have a very good chance of working with your examiner uh, to uh, you know, to come up with with allowable subject matter there. Uh, and, and I mentioned working with your examiner, uh, and whether that's through you yourself or your your patent attorney, um, you always have the opportunity to, as I, I alluded to before, uh, pick up the phone and talk with the examiner about the status of your case and about the best way to overcome um, any any issues or any rejections that the examiner has made. Uh, and, and that's done through what we call the interview. Uh, just a fancy way of, uh, of uh, saying, having a conversation with your examiner. Um, but look at the power that, that a simple phone call or, or web conference with your examiner can have. Of those applications, of those patent applications where you as the applicant or your attorney have taken the time to talk with the examiner to understand the, the rejection and to see how the examiner might recommend overcoming it, your allowance rate, right? Your chance at getting that patent issued jumps to 80% relative to those applications that don't have uh, an interview on file. Uh, so, uh, you know, if you think back to the previous slide and you saw the allowance rate, um, you know, you can really increase your odds of success by, by working with your examiner and, and, you know, talking with them either through yourself or through your attorney uh, throughout the course of prosecution. Okay, and as, as I alluded to before, this is the, the typical timeline um, from the time that you file your application to when it issues uh, as, as a patent. Uh, these just kind of delineate the various, uh, the, the various times and how much time you can expect to spend um, at, at each juncture of prosecution. So I won't belabor that point. Uh, but hopefully once you get through that, all, what, that, that process, um, you know, the, the end of the line is what we call an allowance. Uh, so you've worked with your examiner, you've cleared up all the issues, uh, all the rejections have been overcome. The final step in the process is you get a notice of allowance from the office, uh, and and that that indicates that your your application, your patent application, is now ready to issue as a United States patent, uh, and and that's that's the end of the line. That's the the outcome that we're that we're hoping for. Okay, so before we jump to the q and I'll, I'll just do a, a couple minutes on resources uh, that may be available uh, for you. Um, like I said, if you're looking for local help from the PTO, we've got a number of regional offices across the country. Uh, and, and, and again, uh, our office in, uh, in, in San Jose covers, uh, covers the West Coast, including Arizona. Uh, so... Uh, I, I'm, I can be your, uh, I'm your, I'm your point of contact for, uh, for the, for the West Coast uh, USPTO. We also offer uh, a 1-800 number. Uh, sometimes as you're going through the application process or you, you get a letter from the USPTO that just doesn't make sense and you, you want to pick up the phone and call someone and you don't know who to call, uh, there's a 1-800 number here. Um, that is, uh, we call the Inventor Assistance Center. Uh, you know, these are these are people that have worked at the PTO uh, for a significant amount of time. They're all uh, former uh, supervisors of patent examiners, so they've they've been through the process. They've been through the the patent application process often for decades, uh, and they can be a great guide to help you uh, get a particular case unstuck or help you understand what your options are, depending on where you are in, in prosecution. Okay. So how much does it cost to hire a patent attorney to do a lot of what we said before? 
to to write your application for you, to write your claims, to file your application with the USPTO, to to manage all of that back and forth with your patent examiner. How much does that cost uh, in attorney fees? Uh, we looked at USPTO fees and saw, generally speaking, for under $1,000, you can have your application filed. Um, but working with an attorney, uh, a registered licensed patent attorney or agent, can cost uh, you know, traditionally between you know ten and, and twenty five thousand uh, dollars to prepare, file, and prosecute a single patent application, uh, and and that cost can be prohibitive, uh, particularly to uh, to smaller companies, to to startups uh, that you know have a limited budget and and you know don't have you know. A, Ten to twenty-five thousand sitting around to work with a patent attorney. Uh, so don't despair. There are options, uh, and the option that I think is, is is front and center here is what we call the patent pro bono program. Uh, again, so this is a, a nationwide network that partners uh, people that have inventive uh, ideas that are worthy of uh, maybe a patent application. Uh, with attorneys, with registered patent attorneys in your region that will work with you to file your application and prosecute prosecute it for you uh, at at no cost. Uh, and there are there are some requirements. You have to be uh, below a certain income level to qualify for the program, and you you have to actually have an invention. Uh, but if you if you meet those requirements, um, you know you can be partnered with a patent attorney who will work with you at no cost to to file your your application. Uh, and and this is just a, a nationwide chart here showing uh, the uh, kind of local administration of these programs. So in Arizona, there's the uh, Arizona Public Patent Program that uh, that administers the the the, uh, the program in your area. And again, that's a collaboration between the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office and uh, this network of regional providers um, that connect you with these uh, with these local patent attorneys. So, so help is out there. Don't despair uh, if you if you can't afford uh, to to hire attorney uh, commercially. Um, one more resource I'll, I'll throw out there, similar to the Patent Pro Bono Program. Uh, there's a what we call a law school clinic program, um, and, and again, this is a way of uh, partnering you uh, with uh, with someone. In this case, someone through a local law school uh, that has a, a patent program that will work with you to again file your patent application on on your behalf. Um, so if you're, you know, typically people start with the patent pro bono program, uh, but if for whatever reason you're not able to get uh, get traction there, uh, there's there's another option uh, through uh, the local uh, law schools in in your area. Uh, and, and last but not least, I'll, I'll mention um, what we call the Patent and Trademark Resource Centers. This is a, a nationwide network of state public academic libraries. Uh, that are charged with disseminating patent and trademark information to the public. Um, so when might you use one of these? Uh, you know, for example, we talked about at the beginning the importance of doing that patent search. Uh, many patent and trademark resource centers offer uh, educational uh, courses on how to really do an effective patent search. Uh, they have trained librarians that can help you through that process. Um, and they've got a host of other resources that can aid you in filing the patent application or connecting you with local uh, local pro bono resources. Uh, so I'll I'll end it there uh, with with this uh, with a couple of handy links uh, here that, uh, that that point to some of the things that I mentioned before everything from the pro se assistance. Uh, guides you know, to how to qualify for micro entity status and get those fee discounts uh, to some of the resources I shared earlier about the the parts form and contents of the patent application um, so so with that I know I threw a lot at you uh, often uh, with with uh, not a lot of time to digest everything but I think we've got about 
15 minutes or so. So happy to, to stick around and answer any, any questions that, uh, that you all may have in the, in the Q&A box there. So Stephen, did you just want to go ahead and read those? Because um, I'm not quite sure, you know, which you may have already answered. Sure, sure, and, and I'll I'll just kind of go through these uh, go through these chronologically. Um, so, kind of getting back to basics, there's a question on on software. So, so wh where does software? Well, can you get a patent on software? You know, how does how does that work? Um, and you know, it's uh, that's a definitely a, a hot button issue right now on uh, what scope of, uh, what type of intellectual property covers software, right? There was a recently a, a copyright decision that, uh, that came from the Supreme Court uh, that, that examined, um, you know, what aspects of, of, uh, of software is copyrightable uh, and, and how that relates to, uh, to the utility patents. Um, what we encourage people to think about is, what does your software do? Right. What, what's the what's the inputs to the system? What does the software do? And then what's the what's the output of the of the system? And you know how does that interact with with something in in the real world? Whether it's a whether it's a a, a database um, that you're you're using to have some type of tangible impact on uh, on, on something that you can show in the in, in the real world. Um, that's not just software per se. Um, again, the, the more the more tangible, the more kind of real world input and outputs you can show uh, through your software, the more likely it is to qualify for uh, for that utility patent. So, uh, again, this is an actively evolving area of law. Um, we're getting you know decisions from the federal circuit on a fairly regular basis that delineate the eligibility of uh, of software as it as it you know relates to uh, to patenting. Um, so what I say today may not necessarily be be applicable um, you know a few months or years down the road, um, but that's a uh, like I said that's a really really interesting area of law. And, and again, the more that you can describe your software in terms of its practical, uh, real-world effect, uh, the more likely you are to be successful in, in obtaining a software uh, a patent. Okay, quick question on design patents and, and kind of what goes into the design patent application. Um, so in, in contrast to the utility patent application, which we, we looked at and had a lot of you know, written description um, plus drawings. Uh, the design patent application is almost exclusively uh, drawings, right? You, there, there's, there's really no written description that goes into the design patent application. You, you just need to show um, the, the drawings in sufficient detail um, so that every aspect, again, of the of the visual distinctiveness that you're trying to protect, is is captured in the drawing. So, uh, so 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 just just the just the drawings for design. Um, so a, a question on obviousness, right? We 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 talked about, and this is getting back into the utility patents here from from designs. So, what constitutes Obviousness, right? I think novelty is is the one that uh, it's, it's a little little easier to understand, right? Has it been done before in exactly the way that you've described it? Sure, um, but but how do you decide and who decides what would or wouldn't be obvious? Um, and I'll start with the who. The, the decider in that case is the patent examiner that's working on your application. So it's it's not a committee, it's it's not a board that you go in front of and, and make your case. It's the job of the patent examiner to make that obviousness determination, right? And and it, and as I, I hinted at, it's it's a question of law uh, that's that has a, a basis in in fact finding. So the examiner acts as a fact finder and assembles all of the, the prior art. We talked about the prior art that's been done before. 
And then the examiner uses the, the prior art as the factual basis for making the legal determination of whether or not it would have been obvious to, uh, to you know, make your invention in the way that you've, you've described it. Um, and, and this is an area where having a patent attorney uh, supporting you can really come in handy uh, because it is a it, it is a legalistic determination, right? It is a conclusion of law uh, that the the examiner makes. And this is why we we do recommend working with a patent attorney to prepare your application, uh, especially to prepare your claims, and to aid you in having this discussion with your patent examiner, um, especially if you're not well versed in the, the intricacies of, uh, of patent law. So, so this is where, and this is why that price tag can be so high for, for patent attorneys uh, and, and agents. Uh, because they really are specialists in both the technology and the law and, uh, and, and can aid you through that obviousness uh, determination with, with your patent examiner. Um, so that, that's really where the value of, uh, of a patent attorney comes into play. Okay, so kind of along the same lines, a question on prior art, where do you go? Right. I, I talked about the importance of, of you know, doing a search, seeing what's been done before. But but how do you do where, how do you do a search? Where do you go to search? How, you know, where do you find that that prior art? A um, uh, couple things I'll say here real quick. One, um, it, it's it's a good idea to check the patent literature just to see what's been published out there before. Um, and you can do that through uh, the USPTO offers a, a patent search tool that you can use. Uh, there are a number of other uh, third party tools uh, that uh, that you can use as well. Um, and then, you know, know your art, right? Know your field of endeavor and know where things get published in your field of endeavor. Right. Is, is there a particular trade journal um, that's heavily used where the latest and greatest ideas get published in that trade journal? Is there a is there a scholarly, uh, you know, I, I used to used to work in the field of, uh, of, of medical imaging and uh, everything, uh, you know, in, in that area was published in the the IEEE transactions on medical imaging, right? That was the scholarly journal that we would go to to see what was the latest and greatest in, in the medical imaging field. So you really do have to know your particular uh, field of endeavor and, and where things get published. Um, so kind of one, look at the patent world, and then two, look at uh, look at your field of endeavor and, and you know, where something would uh, would, would surface. Um, and, and I will say too, in, in, uh, in a bit of a, a shameless plug, uh, our office and, and, and the USPTO in general offers uh, regular patent search workshops. Uh, and, and this is something that we can share with you after the meeting as well for those that are interested. They're free, open to the public, uh, where we walk you through uh, in about 90 minutes the process, uh, the, the tools that are out there, and how you might really think about structuring a, a search, both for patent literature and, and other literature, um, so that you can be even more confident um, that you've, you've, found, uh, you've found the best, uh, the best art. Okay, a couple of a quick questions here. One on uh, hand sanitizer. We, what, what, what would that be? Um, so that, that would go back to that uh, maybe that composition of matter, right? We, we talked about what's what's eligible for patenting. You know, machines and uh, manufacturers and uh, methods, but uh, but compositions of matter uh, would, would fall under you know something for a, a novel uh, and non obvious uh, hand sanitizer formulation. Uh, so that that's that's certainly eligible for for utility patents as a composition of uh, of, of matter. Okay, just ticking down uh, ticking down the list here. It's an interesting question on military sensitivity. Um, 
so so yes there there is uh you know, there there is an avenue for uh, you know if if your you know invention was was developed in in partnership say with uh, with with, uh, with with uh, say a grant from uh, from a federal agency or or from a branch of the military uh, the military may have certain rights to uh, to your patent or the the agency that provided the grant may have uh, certain rights or ownership stake in the in the patent if uh, if if it was developed in association with funding or or a grant um, and the, and there is that mechanism to flag technology that uh, that that may have that applicability um, for uh, for further review um, so that's a that's interesting interesting question there um, one on the difference between the uh, the utility patent and uh, and and provisional uh, patent. Uh, it's it's a, it's a good question, um, and basically, and we didn't talk much about it, but the the provisional patent is um, is the kind of most low cost option that you have to get your foot in the door to get that patent pending status um, in the shortest amount of time uh, possible. Uh, so for example, um, we, we talked earlier about the dangers of disclosure and the risks that you may face in publicly disclosing your invention before you file an application. So, so say you've got a trade show coming up uh, in a week and you're going to be featuring your product at that trade show. Um, and after today, you now know that that counts as a public disclosure. You're, you're putting your product out there to the public in a, in a public forum. Uh, so that's a public disclosure. And you know that that can negatively impact your ability to get a patent here in the US and especially overseas. And it's a week away. And, and you don't have time to hire an attorney and vet an attorney and, and prepare your application and, and, and draw up the claims and, you know, really calibrate where your fence should be. You know, you just can't do that in a week. So what can you do? And, and that's where the provisional uh, patent application comes into play. Uh, the, the provisional patent application, again, it, it's extremely low cost if you're a uh, if you're a micro entity, it's under $100 in the filing fee. Um, and it does not require, it does not require any claims in the provisional patent application. So you, you don't even have to tell us where you think your fence is at that point. The provisional application is just your written description and any drawings that you have, right? And what it does is it, establishes you as the inventor as of the date that you file that patent, that, that provisional application. And it buys you one year, one year of patent pending status. Um, so what you can do in that year is one, decide if you would like to, uh, to file a subsequent utility patent application on that. Um, it gives you a year to kind of see what the what the interest might be in your in your application, right? It gives you a year to have some of that public disclosure um, while having that patent pending status, and it does so for incredibly low cost. Like I said, under a hundred dollars, and again, you don't need claims. You don't need to show us where your fence is, which means that you may not even need to work with, with a patent attorney to get it filed. So if you're, if you're in a pinch, if you think, boy, I'd really benefit from patent pending status because I've got some upcoming public disclosure, really think about, uh, about that provisional um, application there as the, again, the cheapest, uh, most effective way to get patent pending status, protect yourself against the risks of disclosure, uh, and, and again, not have to worry about, about coming up with your, with your claims there. So I, I appreciate that we're, we're running low on time here. Um, so I, I 
maybe I'll, I'll pause there. And uh, I don't know if, uh, if, 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 if Lou wants to, wants to jump in and, uh, and, and end it here, or, or what do you, what do you think? We've Lou? got a, we've got a couple um, additional um, areas on the SBDC to cover here at the end, along with our survey. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about counseling, Steve, and kind of how that works with regard to the SBDC. Um, so if you want to talk to an individual counselor, you can use this particular link to sign up. Counseling is by appointment only. Um, what usually you have an initial counseling session. Whoop, I'm sorry for the technology here. Uh, and that, that kind of identifies the business goals and assistance needed. We've got follow on sessions. You meet with a counselor on a regular basis. We're tracking business goals and metrics. Um, you know, I do a lot of uh, counseling around technology or uh, certainly around technology. There's a lot of patent discussion. And so that's, um, you know, that's really, really important. And, and uh, Steve, what you've provided us was really a great foundation for discussion, helping, helping everybody understand, you know, what, you know, why it's important and what they need to do um, to, uh, to secure a patent. You know, we talk about patents in a little more uh, in a broader category in terms of your business. And um, we've got uh, counselors that can help you with that. Um, we've got some upcoming webinars. There's on Monday, there's an, uh, um, an export uh, consideration um, in, um, during COVID, uh, how to navigate international waters. And then for any of you who are in the local ecosystem here in Arizona and think that you've got, you know, your early stage, you've got some technology uh, you may want to uh, think about Venture Madness, um, which is a, um, a local competition. Um, and it's a competition for, there's some, there's some cash prizes, but it's really for exposure. We get a lot of angels. We get a lot of uh, venture capitals that come in. So matter of fact, that, that Venture Madness um, will happen on Tuesday, but we're moving it to, 10, to 9.30 to 10.30. So um, if you go to sign up, you'll see it's a half hour earlier. We've got more webinars. Um, Donna, do you know if this, uh, uh, the great marketing turnaround is still scheduled? Yes, it is. It's the second session, which is on May 13th. And then um, Heidi Kirkland will also present the third session on June 3rd. Okay, perfect. But check our calendar. Um, you know, you can register easily, just like you registered for this one. Check our calendar. There's also, there's always lots of good um, inf informational uh, programming. Um, you can go to our webpage. Uh, here's our link, and again, uh, this this will all be recorded, so you can you can you can follow this um, at, um, and follow up. Um, our, our event calendar. There's a bunch of COVID nineteen resources on there. There's our council biographies. You can follow us on Facebook. You can follow us on LinkedIn. Um, there's lots of good stuff happening at the SBDC. We're glad you found us. Um, and if you know anybody else who might need our services, please feel free to, uh, to pass it along. We don't do a lot of advertising. Most of everything we do is by word of mouth. Um, again, thank you for joining us today. And again, thank you to Steve. Steve, it was terrific. Um, maybe we can do this again at, at some point. Um, and, and we really appreciate it. Um, go ahead. So we have an evaluation no, coming up. I'm sorry. No, just going to say thank you all and uh, appreciate the opportunity and, and uh, don't hesitate to reach out to your, your, your friends at the USPTO if you've got additional questions. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks again, Steve. Donna, you have an evaluation? Uh, yes, the evaluation will be sent automatically as soon as this Zoom uh, webinar is over. And like uh, Lou said, we will be sending out this recording to all registrants along with the presentation. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you and have a, have a great rest of your day, everybody.